So in this video, I'm going to release the personal statement that helped me receive an offer from Cambridge University to study the three year BA degree in economics. It also helped me achieve offers for three other universities, all of the top 10 for economics within the UK, which were Bristol, Bath and Warwick. I'm gonna look at every single paragraph, dissect it, what I did well, what I shouldn't have said, what I wish I said differently, and hopefully this will help you when writing your personal statement. But before we fully get into the video, I do want to give a few caveats. So to be totally honest, I was really contemplating about whether or not I should make this video. And the reason for that is because releasing personal statements to the internet and online may not always be beneficial to you who's watching this. And the main reason for that is the whole point of personal statements is that they are personal. And what this means is that they should be individual and unique to you. They should be telling a story about why you want to study your subject, what parts of the subject you're really interested in, why you want to spend the next three, four, five, six, seven years of your life really dedicated to this subject or this field. And in that sense, when someone releases a personal statement online, that could taint your opinions and maybe defer your personal statement away from being truly personal. So although videos like this can be really helpful in inspiring you and see how other people write their personal statements, please don't use this as a blueprint or put it on a pedestal. Personal statements should be unique to your style of writing, what you want to say and your own experiences. And the second sort of caveat is that UCAS do similarity checks. So videos such as this may not be the most helpful as they could give you the inclination to copy a few bits or take a couple sentences, which UCAS may pick up on. As another caveat, this personal statement isn't the only reason why I got offers from the university that I did. University applications consist of a wide range of things, not just personal statements. You also have your grades, predicted grades, admission tests, interviews, teacher references, etc. So please don't think that this personal statement is the sole reason that I got the offers that I did. So with those caveats out of the way, let's get into the video. So my personal statement consists of six paragraphs. The opening paragraph, four paragraphs which are then combined to form the body of the personal statement, and then a final closing paragraph. So this was the first paragraph of my personal statement. My desire to study economics is rooted in my love of problem solving. So as an opening statement, I was pretty happy with this. For me personally, I wanted that first line, that first paragraph, that first sentence to be really strong and to really show the person reading it why I wanted to study economics. And it actually took me quite a long time to concisely pinpoint the exact reason about why I wanted to study economics. And the kind of journey I took on to get to this point was that, well, I love maths. And the reason I love maths is because I love the problem solving aspect of it. But the reason that I didn't want to go study maths at university level is because I kind of wanted to apply it to humans. I'm really fascinated by human interaction, by games, by why people do the things that they do. And I kind of saw economics as the beautiful combinations of these two things that I loved. And essentially, I saw economics as the most interesting, the most intriguing problem solving subject there was. And hence why I applied for courses to study economics at university. For me, I just wanted them to know from the off why I wanted to study economics. Okay, and now on to paragraph two. So the next paragraph for me was kind of about my achievements in mathematics. Because if you're unaware, degree courses in economics at universities are often heavily mathematical based. So I wanted to show that I have a competence and an interest in mathematics and that side of economics. So this is how the second paragraph of my personal statement reads. Individual and team UKMT, which if you're unaware stands for UK Mathematics Trust, challenges allowed me to improve and develop my problem solving skills and granted me the opportunity to present and explain my solutions and methods to others. I was proud of achieving my secondary school's best score in the individual challenge and participating in the Olympiad round, providing me with a chance to face more complex problems, pushing me to think creatively to find possible strategies. Now, I think this paragraph is okay. It's not amazing, but it's not too bad. I've outlined my achievements, which is always a good thing to do, and I've kind of explained what I've gained from participating in such things, such as individual and team UKMT challenges. Looking back at it now, I kind of wish I'd also added some things about the team challenges that I participated in. For instance, when I was in year eight, I was in a team challenge with some year nines, who were obviously more intelligent than me and better at maths than me at that point. So I almost wish I included something about how I learned from them and I was able to kind of listen and gain new things. Because I think not knowing, but being able to listen and learn is a really important skill when applying to top universities. And then the third paragraph is kind of where I start to get into what I've done to show my love for economics. And this paragraph in particular focuses on my interest in game theory. And this is how it reads. Game theory fascinates me, a term I first read about in Das Gupta's Economics, A Very Short Introduction. Chapter two includes concepts such as Nash Equilibrium, which captivated me as it provides a logical and stable solution for the outcome of interactions. 
You may or may not have noticed, but throughout my personal statement, I kind of want to tell a story. So for me personally, I kind of want it to be like, this happened, which led me to explore this, which then led to this. So it's sort of like a chain of reasoning of what I've done to show my interest. So in this case, my introduction to game theory kind of arose from reading a very simple economics book, which was literally an introduction to economics. In hindsight, I probably didn't need to reference the book, but I kind of just wanted them to clearly see the story I was telling. Also, I don't know if I needed to outline kind of what I meant by Nash Equilibrium. You know, the economists at really prestigious universities, they definitely know. So I may have just taken that out to free up some more characters to use elsewhere. So now continuing on, I said, this encouraged me to begin an online course about game theory, where over the span of eight weeks, I was introduced to various games, strategies, and equilibrium. Studying the range of different strategies and respective outcomes led me to appreciate the complexity and intricacy of interactions between agents. So I think these sentences were quite good. And one thing that really helped with my personal statement is that I did an online course on game theory, which A, really helped me with my understanding, and B, looks so, so good because it shows real initiative. And I outlined more about that course in this video here. I go on to say, I especially enjoyed looking at extensive form games, which introduced the notion of sequencing to the player actions, in a lot of cases, this made games more applicable to real-world scenarios. Like many things, economics is a subject where it's kind of like theory versus reality, and we kind of want them to align, but in actuality, they don't, for numerous reasons. But I'm pretty happy that I mentioned kind of the real-world application of economics alongside the theory side, which I talk about in other parts of my personal statement, to show I have a knowledge of kind of both aspects. Moreover, the incorporation of mathematics was fulfilling. For instance, the use of differentiation when looking at solutions for maximum strategies. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted the people reading this to know, I know that economics has really deep mathematical rooting, and I'm all for that, and I find that really interesting. Continuing on, the course showed me how decisions are made in different circumstances, and allowed me to clearly see economics' deep mathematical rooting. Yet, it also revealed that not all expected outcomes were seen in real life situations, evidenced in experiments such as the two thirds the average game. Now this was quite weak I think. I like what I was saying in terms of, hey, you know, in theory things should happen, but in reality they don't, and I'm kind of interested about why that is, but my example here was really poor. Essentially the reason I said that was because in the course I participated in, it showed kind of like the theory about the two thirds the average game, which to briefly summarise is a game when you ask like a hundred competitors, okay, everyone's going to pick a number and you win if you get two thirds of the average. So for instance, if the number everyone picked was, I don't know, 66, the winner would be the person who got 44 because 44 is two thirds of 66. And essentially if you work through that where people could pick a number from 1 to 100, then the Nash equilibrium, like the stable outcome, would be everyone picks 1. But when they do this experiment in actuality with people that aren't, you know, economists, and even with economists, um, you usually get that that doesn't happen. People usually pick like 33 and 66. And it was that thing that, hey, this should happen, but it doesn't, that I wanted to outline here. But I didn't elaborate on that example. I didn't give any reasons why. I didn't explain it. So the people reading that were probably pretty confused. So if I were to go back and rewrite it, I just probably would have left this out. I wouldn't have said evidence than anything because I don't know if I need to provide evidence in that case. And I'd go straight on to what I was going to talk about next, which is behavior economics. So yeah, that's something that I wish I didn't do. I wish I did differently, but hey ho. Every personal statement when someone looks back at it isn't going to 100% agree with everything they said. And that's okay. So anyway, to finish this paragraph off, I said, this showed how agents may not make choices that maximize their expected utility, leading me to question how likely these predicted outcomes are to be seen in action. So I'm pretty happy with this paragraph. I liked what I was saying. I liked the story I told about the journey of how I got interested in game theory. And I liked how I ended it leading on to the fact that I'm interested in behavior economics as well. However, as you can see, there were some things that I kind of wish I didn't do or some things I wish I did differently. So now moving on to paragraph four. And again, like paragraph three, Paragraph four is more of me exploring the things of economics that I'm really interested in, the things that I questioned, the things that I researched, and what I've learned. So here's how it starts. It was here where I first met the idea of behavior economics, and was inspired to look into it further, which I first did by reading Freakonomics. Now, Freakonomics is kind of like the bread and butter of economics books that basically everyone who applies to university is going to read. And I was actually considering whether or not I should mention this book, because I know everyone else would, but I thought, well, there's no harm in doing so. I did read the book, I was quite interested in it, and it did introduce me to some behavioral economic ideas. So carrying on, although the book lacked deep analysis into behavioral economic theories, it showed the vast range of factors that affect even the simplest decisions. 
Engrossed, I began to read Michelle Bagley's Behaviour Economics. I was particularly interested in the effect of behaviour economics on the macro economy. So again, like in paragraph three, I want this paragraph to start off with me telling a story. And that story being the journey of how I became interested in the things that I'm interested in. So in this case, I finished the game theory course that kind of sparked an interest in behaviour economics and theory versus reality. So I read for economics and then went on to read an introduction to behaviour economics, which I actually have here. A very interesting book, I would recommend it. And then from that, I got interested in the effects of behaviour economics on the macro economy. So I then went on to say, I was fascinated to learn the impact of optimism bias on public investment. And optimism bias was something that I did learn from that book and I still find really interesting. Essentially, it's the idea that when we plan a project or an idea, because we want to see that project or idea succeed, we're optimistic. And that causes us to have a bias. So we kind of overinflate the positives and underinflate the negatives, which can obviously have negative and detrimental effects to things like budgeting and forecasting. And I do actually explain this in my personal statement. So I say, this is where planners are not realistic about the prospects of their projects resulting in them underestimating the costs and overestimating the benefits. This caused me to challenge traditional cost-benefit analysis due to the inaccuracy in magnitude of both variables. And again, I think that's quite good. But then here comes my biggest kind of regret in my personal statement. So what I wish I said is how I'm fascinated of how they calculate such optimism bias, because that is fascinating. Like, how do you calculate how much you're overinflating the benefits and underinflating the negatives? It must be really complicated and really advanced, and that just sounds kind of awesome. And when I was looking into this, I kind of stumbled across a 30 page document from HS2, which is a high speed rail network that we're building in the UK to reduce geographical mobility, kind of reduce the north south divide and stuff like that. And in there, it actually mentioned optimism bias. So they must have accounted for it some way. I really wish I mentioned in my personal statement the interest I have about how they calculate things such as optimism bias. However, I didn't, and I don't really know why, because it would have been a great thing to say, and it's something really key that I missed out. Instead, I went on to say this. To look into this further, I attended the LSE online event, Mission Economy, a moonshot guide to changing capitalism, presented by Professor Mazakuto, who too challenged the way we should evaluate public investments. I wanted to mention the fact that, hey, I've attended some online lectures, but in hindsight, I kind of wish I didn't mention this because although I was kind of interested in this lecture, I wasn't the most interested. And I kind of wish I had talked about what I said earlier about how they calculate things like optimism bias. But you only get a finite number of characters. So I guess there's kind of like a value judgment to be made here. So anyway, to finish the paragraph, I talk more about this lecture I attended. She suggests we should place a larger emphasis on missions and capturing the dynamics below as that occur referencing the Apollo program, rather than just looking at cost benefit analysis. And to be honest, I don't really know if that was entirely what she was saying, but for a lot of the lectures, she was actually talking about the stratification of kind of levels and how this should be implemented in the UK. And I think looking back at it now, I probably missed the main message of that lecture. So yes, I do kind of regret putting this particular lecture in my personal statement. In practice, I believe this would be difficult and risky due to the uncertainty in the value of spillovers that occur. I concluded that there is a need to perform current cost benefit analysis on public investment through increased impartial scrutiny into propositions as focusing solely on potential spillovers carries too great a risk. And honestly, I think that's the poorest part of my personal statement. The reason I said that was because I wanted to be like, hey, I thought about this and I've got a conclusion. But my conclusion there, I think personally, is quite naive and quite poor. I've just said increased impartial scrutiny, but I haven't really explained what I mean by that, how it could be implemented. And again, I think I missed the main point of that lecture. So if I was changing a thing, it would definitely be taking this out and putting other stuff in. But that just shows you that not all personal statements are perfect and that they don't need to be perfect for you to get the offers you want to get. But now moving on to paragraph five. And in this paragraph, this is where I kind of talked a little bit about me. So I talk about the activities I get involved in and kind of me as a person. But this paragraph is quite short compared to the others. And there's a reason for that. And this is because the universities I was applying for didn't really care and they don't really care about the extracurricular activities that I've engaged in. Their main and for some, the sole focus is how good I am, how interested I am, how teachable I am academically. So that's why this paragraph is quite short compared to the others. It reads like this. As a member of my school debating team, I developed my analytical capabilities. My ability to coherently present chains of reasoning led me to represent my school at the Oxford School's debate competition, an eye-opening experience which allowed me to both develop my skills and learn from other debaters. Being both deputy head boy and captain of my football team has improved my leadership skills and time management. 
I think the first kind of half or two thirds of that paragraph is quite good where I'm talking about my debating because debating and arguing and being analytical are really good skills to have for a subject such as economics. However, the second kind of half or third, which is about being deputy head boy and captain of my football team is quite weak, but I just threw it in there because I thought I should. And then to finish off, this was my sixth and final paragraph. Studying economics at university will offer me a valuable and challenging experience and allow me to fulfill my academic potential. I actually think this was a decent kind of final paragraph, final line, and it just showed that I really want to study economics and what it will do for me. So there you have it, that is me dissecting and analysing my personal statement. I hope you find this video interesting, insightful or informative in some way. And if you have any questions about university applications, writing your personal statements, or just anything in general, please do leave a comment down below. And if you check out this playlist here, these are all the videos I have where I talk about university applications and stuff like that. Anyway, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next week. Goodbye.